and thank you for having me. Thank you for the invitation, Mario and Nicholas. Uh, it's my first time in Bern, and I already love it. Uh, both the city, but also the conference you have here. It, it's been a great morning. Uh, thank you to all the other speakers. I learned a lot just sitting here. Uh, thank you for staying and, and listening to me, uh, even though I understand that most of you are waiting for Ian. So if you bear with me for 20 to 25 minutes, and Ian is on, and it's going to be high level again. Uh, so uh, I work with, with these uh, guys and, and boys mainly. I'm very privileged. Uh, to, to work with my hobby, uh, youth elite handball players. Uh, I have a wife and two kids as well, but so have my friends, but they don't have the privilege to work with these. So that's, that's uh, my main privilege. Uh, but I have a wife and two kids as well, and, and I love them. Uh, but if I have to choose, <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, so conflict of interest, I, I work uh, both in research uh, and mainly in injury prevention. I, I used to be quite quite interesting guy. Now I work in, in sports medicine and epidemiology. Uh, and I work in the clinics. I meet them in the clinic uh, when they get, get busted in the shoulders. Uh, and my main goal, whether it's, it's working in the clinic or research, is preventing this. Uh, so this is Denmark winning another gold medal. It was last year. Uh, it's in Denmark, then it's Norway. So that's my main conflict of interest. <laughs> on, a, on a serious note, though, I just want to highlight that the fact that, uh, and, and Meret addressed this earlier this morning, uh, it's, it's on the contrary. We, we help each other a lot, actually. We share our experience when we're doing research, etc. And I think that's one of the success things uh, when, we, when we're doing research, especially in Hamburg, that the Norwegian team, uh, and Meret is in her colleagues and our we, we share our knowledge and, and trying to make things better uh, as long as we go. So, uh, return to sport in, in handball. So, regardless of your injury uh, or, or your sport, I think you have to ask yourself, what's the, what's the worst thing you're going to expose your shoulder to on a regular basis? Uh, not, not the average stuff, but what's the worst thing? And uh, that's what we need to prepare you for. So, that means that you know, have to know your sport, and in handball, it's, it's quite tough. Uh, so we have a lot, a lot of wrestling, uh, strangling, apparently. Uh, so it's, it's a contact sport, for sure. Uh, but on the other hand, we also have a lot of throwing. So it's also a throwing sport. Uh, and so it's pretty much rugby combined with baseball. Uh, and Meret addressed this before, so it's the best sport. Uh, and if you don't believe me, believe Meret, because she's an expert. So it's the best sport. Uh, and I'm going to address more the throwing part, because Ian is coming up later and, and talking about rugby. Uh, and I think you can use a lot of the stuff that Ian will talk about uh, in handball as well. So, uh, with throwing, and I'm going to come back to this a little bit later. We saw so a video from Suzanne's talk on, uh, with Roger Federer, which was lovely. Uh, but it's nothing compared to this. <laughs> this, is, this is a jump throw. It's, it's a Norwegian guy, i give you that. Uh, but it's, it's the similarity with, with what we show with Federer, it's, it looks so easy. And, and when he's landing, he has a cocky landing, so he just lands and it's done. It's so easy. So he uses his full force to produce a lot, lot of uh, high-velocity throw. And I'm going to come back to that when we talk about a little bit kinetic chain and, and throwing mechan uh, mechanism. So what we are preparing them for is a huge huge load on the shoulder. We don't have any, any numbers on, on handball, but if you're looking at other throwing uh, sports, it's pretty much similar to your body weight. That's the traction force when you're in the deceleration phase. And Anne addressed this as well, uh, about the, the parachute. So this is what we need to prepare them for. So if you're a 100 kilo handball player, that's around 100 kilo traction force to your shoulder every time you throw. Uh, and it's a dip, little bit different in different sports. So handball is tough. Uh, some sports are tougher than others. And I just want to warn any sensitive uh, people in the, in the audience, this is a nasty injury uh, that we don't see in handball, though. It's, it's mainly a football injury uh, that we see. <laughs> so it's, it, this is much more common than the shoulder injuries that, that Marlin told us. Uh, it's a Danish player, by the way. Uh, I worked 20 years in handball. I've never seen this. Ugly, ugly injury. 
Uh, the return to sports rate is pretty much zero, I think. Uh, return to your pride is pretty much zero as well, I think. So, return to sport uh, or the return to play after shoulder injury in handball, uh, regardless of what type of, of injury you have, uh, eventually you have to throw something, right? So, we often start off with a little bit different. We, we had some excellent talk this morning about instability, uh, etc. And I'm going to address a little bit about what I do with my, my players here and trying to figure out when are you ready to go out and do your maximum throws again. Uh, when, when will we let you play uh, without any, any restrictions? So pretty much this, uh, the sport specific and return to sport. I just want to highlight that this is often what we're, what we're thinking, but we also have to acknowledge what's happening in the head of the patient. So when we're in this phase, they have to be super confident about going back to, to play. Uh, so it's not just what we think happening in the, in the body, what we're doing with our, with our patient, but also what's going on in their head. So, we're going here. So, if you look at handball, uh, the sport specific demands, we, we talked about a lot about shoulder strength, uh, we have power, speed, endurance, and mobility, and that's pretty much what we know from, from the risk factors, and shoulder strength seems to be the only one that's really consistent where we don't have any conflicting results uh, in, in terms of risk factor for handball players. And then we talked a little bit about throwing motion technique, the kinetic chain, and I know Ian will address this later as well, and we will also have a panel talk uh, about it. And then we have the contact wrestling tackling, and we also have the workloads. So we have the general workload, but also the throwing or, or the shoulder-specific workloads. So that's, that's the, the, the demand that we need to, to uh, have the player to be ready for. Oops, sorry. So, if you're looking at the, the end phase, what we're trying to do is a lot, a lot of things similar that we heard earlier in earlier talks. So pretty much the same. I'm not going to show you videos. We saw some, some excellent videos, much better videos than I have on that. Uh, I'm going to focus a little bit sorry, about throwing or, or striking program. And the criteria that I have, I want them to be pain-free during a brake test with a, with a handheld dynamometer and, and no pain. And we had a discussion before and, and, and yesterday about pain-free or not. But what I mean by that is not that they're not going to feel anything in their shoulder, but I don't want it to be really, really painful so they can't perform the test. Okay? So if we have a handball player and they never have supposed to feel anything in their shoulder, I think we're going to just stay. And we won't progress the, the uh, rehabilitation. So the way that I test them is, is in the 90-90 position. Uh, described by, by Anne and her colleagues a couple of years ago, and abduction is, is tested in, in a standing position like that, uh, described by, by Clarsen and his colleagues. So we test eccentric external internal rotation, and we do the eccentric going from 90 to 0 degrees, and we do it in 3 seconds, so that's 30 degrees per second. Uh, also uh, from, from Anne's colleague, Frederick, describe that, so it's a reliable way to, to measure the strength. Uh, the problem with, with the testing the eccentric, you have to be stronger than the, than the player. So that could be tough. Uh, and, uh, and we actually had a, a, a bachelor thesis testing this, and they found out that every player in their team had the same strength. <laughs> and they were really, really happy about it. It was significant. So, and then we found out it's probably your strength that you measured. Uh, but now we know your strength for sure. Uh, so still a, still a good study, but that's something that we have to consider. And then I introduced the throwing program, uh, and we're starting on the low level, uh, depending on, on what level they are. So having someone come back for, from perhaps like a slap lesion or, or instability, we're going to start really, really slow. But someone with an overuse problem, perhaps starting already at a four or a five. So we have to find out their, their level. So it consists of... of, of uh, 50% or lower for the first steps, so they do that for a week, and if they're pain-free, they can go on to another one and the next level as well. Uh, it's very good if, if they know their own throwing velocity, and, and this age, in these days, you can, can get a really, really cheap uh, speed radar for around 40 or 50 euros, uh, 
and it's often in handball, it's much easier than trying to throw a, a certain distance. So it's very easy for them to know, okay, this is where, where I'm going to throw out. And in the th third phase, we introduced the jump rope, which is a little more tricky to, to do in, uh, with the coordination. Uh, and then we move on. Uh, also some, some, some really good exercises that we've seen before this morning. Uh, what we're doing is, is also testing it now for range of motion and then allow them to go on to the next level in the throwing program. Uh, so if you can, can play the videos, play them all at the same time, I think you, you figure out. Some of them you've already seen. I think Maretta showed this one. I don't know if it's Jeremy who showed that one. That's one of my favorite exercises, just dragging me around on the floor. But it's, it's a really good one. Uh, because I got a lot of exercises as well. And this is something, it's particularly when you're in defense position, someone tried to make a breakthrough and you just grab them with your arm. Uh, so that's a position where they often end up in, 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 the, in the defense position. So just some, some examples of, of exercises that we're, we're doing with them. There's some exercises how we load them in a, in a more and more progressively way into the throwing position. So you start up with the, with the rubber band, so you don't have that much load in the end, end range. You can do it manually, doing the eccentric, and then we put them with the bar, so you can use the other arm as a support. And then we have the, the one, one arm dumbbell. And we're trying to load them as much as possible and doing that in eccentric phase as well. Uh, and this is one, one exercise that we're doing with the, and talked about is deceleration. So we're doing acceleration and trying to decelerate it when it passes your head, and then you have to stop it, and then you kick it back again, and you have to stop it. Just some examples. Uh, we saw some, some uh, catch and, and throw and catch exercises as well that we use. Uh, and Anne addressed the, the, the external rotators, and I, I agree with her. I like them a lot. Uh, so don't, don't think that I don't train them. I just want to show what we're doing on the other side, preparing them for, for throwing. So when it comes to range of motion, uh, it's I just want to address some, some challenges that we're seeing when, we, when we're dressing, when we're testing them for range of motion. The first thing is, is what is restricting the range of motion? Is it the joint capsule? Is it, is it the muscles or soft tissue? Or is it the, the humeral torsion? So it's the humeral head it, itself. Uh, and regardless of that, it's a good study on, on handball players showing that what we're measuring on the bench not necessarily correlate with what happens when they're, they're throwing. Uh, and we did a uh, similar pilot study with, with our adolescents. So on the top one is the, the way that we normally measure external rotation. Pretty much in every study that, that looked at risk factor, we grab the scapula and we external rotate it, and then we feel the scapula start to move, and then we measure that. So we're going from this position to this position, and then we measure the, the range of motion. And then we do the same thing in internal rotation. Okay? So, he has 98 degrees of external rotation, that position. And then I stand him up and try to grab his, his scapula as, as hard as he can, and I just try to bend his arm as much as possible backward, almost like hanging in his, his shoulder. And then he gained another 15 degrees. And then we put him in the lab and put the sensors on and have him throwing and calculate how much of external rotation you have in the glenohumeral joint. And he goes up to 162. So 60 degrees more. So if I have a player on the bench who hasn't any shoulder problem, and I measure him and say, like, All right, am I too stiff or not? Well, I'm not really sure until I've measured you in the lab. But we don't have the lab, right, in the clinic. But an interesting thing is here, he was the second, oh, sorry, he was the second worst, uh, or with, with the less, second less external rotation here. He was with the second most external rotation when he's throwing, and was by far the one who's throw the hardest. So finding him in the clinic and saying, now you should get, gain more external rotation, I don't know if that's a good thing or not. I think what's interesting is, if I twist your arm as much as I can, and that's pain-free, perhaps you're good to go. I'm happy to discuss this later in, in the panel. So the next part that we're going through is, is Going up to, oh, it's a little bit shifted, but it should go down all the way to, to seven. But now they start to throw harder and harder and harder. Uh, and 
this is an entire training session. So it's not doing, uh, doing 20 throws just stand like that. So we're trying to simulate the handball game. So that's a throw, and then it's perhaps 30, 40 seconds rest, and then you do a throw again. So the entire program that they do is the entire training session. So they come down to the court and, and uh, hang along with their, with their teammates, but they're doing their throwing program as well. Now, the kinetic chain. Uh, measuring it without a motion capture laboratory is, is quite hard, I think. Uh, watching a player throw, we can get a rough figure on, on how they throw. Okay. Um, so if we look again at this, this lovely video, uh, it's, it's 0.3 seconds from, from his releasing from the floor until he's, he's releasing the ball. So from lift off to release, it's 0.3 seconds. So if you just pause him in mid air when it's in ball release, so if we're looking at his position and his throwing mechanics in, in mid air, the, the thing that's going to increase his velocity, how fast he can do uh, forward flexion and kick with this one of his legs. So biomechanically, to generate force in a straight throw, you would go from an inverse C like that, having the ball above your, your, your feet, and then you would go into C like that. Then we generate force, and then you will, will land in a cocky face. You would land like that, because you have generated all the force. So biomechanically, he's, he's in a very good position, because he has a straight line from the, from the ball and down here. And to be able to do that, he has to let lateral bend a lot in midair to get that, that uh, what we call perhaps an optimal angle, if there's any. But most of them that throw in really, really hard, they throw with, with the arm in like 125 to 135 degrees of abduction. Even if you're doing a bending throw like that, you're in that position. So biomechanically, this doesn't put that much stress on your shoulder. Compare, if you look at this guy, who is having his arm more way out, and he's left-handed, and they, they, for some reason they, they're throwing with a more straight arm. Don't ask me why, but, but they do. Often also quite good at guitars if you're left-handed, for some reason. Uh, but even if he would bend his elbow more to put it in that position, he would have the ball outside of his body. And if we would look at him doing a throw, he's not kicking his feet like that. He's coming with one feet like that. So he's propelling more, which means that he won't have, uh, be able to generate as much force as the first one. So the question is, if he turns up in the clinic, is this something that we can change? He's 24 years old, he's probably been throwing six or 700,000 throws. Is this something that we can change? Is it something that we should change or not? So in the senior play, like that is professional, going in during the season, we, I think we should try to fix your way of throwing, not necessarily something that will help him. Okay? Perhaps in his way, in his position, Perhaps you just say, okay, you throw with this technique, potentially this put more, more stress on your shoulder. Perhaps you should have more of what we called earlier today the vaccine. Everyone should do something, but perhaps you should do more than the others uh, because of the way you throw. Now, if you're looking at the younger patient, this is a 12-year-old, really good girl, and this is how she throws. So this is cocking face with, with a handball. So she's just quite low on that. And if you're looking at the the ball release, she's pretty much all down here, and it's very, very painful for her. So we're trying to get her to throw with a higher arm, and she's struggling with that with, oh, sorry, she's struggling with that with a handball, so we put her with a tennis ball, and that's perfectly fine. So in her way, she's, she's quite young, it's probably easier to change her, her motor program, we probably have more time we can spend on her, and, and that's the case what we did with her. This was pain-free, so we started throwing like that, started with a hand, uh, with tennis ball, and then moving on to, to a handball. Um. And then the final stage where we have the return to play test. And this is an example of, of what I do. Uh, spoiler alert, we don't have any test that we can say is, that is, is scientifically tested, validated. Is this a good test for, for throwers or handball players? But I'm happy to share what I, what I do with my players, and I will explain you why. So we, the first step, we do a warm-up. So just warming up the shoulders, and then I do a, a strength test, as I showed you. We're doing some push-ups, 
And then I do the Y balance upper limb test. I think it was on the video. I don't know if it was Jeremy who showed it. Uh, we we're trying to see if that's painful or not. If that's not painful, we go on to step two. In step two, we start doing throwing. We start on a low level. We're doing some burpees and we do some side jumps in the defense position. So what we're trying to do is simulate what the, what the player is doing in a handball setting. And then we start throwing a little bit, bit harder. And then I measure them again. If that's pain-free, we go on to this. So depending if you have a youth player or a senior player, it's going to be more or less burpees or clapping burpees. But we're trying to fatigue the players, not only the shoulder, but the entire system. And then we do starting to do hard throws. And at this position, I ask them for their, their uh, rated perceived extortion. How tough was that? And I want to know how tough was it for your shoulder, and I want to know how tough was it, it was overall. If that's good, we strength test them again, same procedure, and then the final stage, we just increase the number of throws and, and, the, and the velocity of the throws. So that's one test that I do, and I do it three times in a week, because I think one time is no time, it could be just lucky to pass it, uh, but if you do it three times uh, and they pass it, then it's okay. And I don't want them to have any identical pain, and as I say, I don't want them to go up above, above three, uh, on a on a bass for that, and why do we need to ask them about about their workload and shoulder specific workload? This is some some new data that we have from our, our uh, RCT that we just finished uh, that Martin Heglin addressed a little bit earlier. So this is their shoulder specific workload. When we ask them rate zero to ten, ten is your maximum, zero is nothing, just rest. How tough was this session or this week on your shoulder? And you can see it's a little bit different from player A, B, and C, and D. And then we ask them their overall workload, where we normally ask them how tough was this. So this is player A's. Red is their overall. B is quite similar. C and D. So we see it doesn't correlate. So if we would ask player C, so how tough was your week? Oh, it's quite moderate. Or we ask, ask the player here, it was quite an easy week, but then we miss out how tough was it for your shoulder. So if we ask our handball players how tough was it, they're thinking like, was I like this? <sighs> or was it fine? So we have players that, no, I wasn't out of breath, but I did 100 throws and I can't lift my arm now. But it wasn't a tough session. So I asked them for, for the RP on your shoulder and, and, uh, and the overall RP. So, what I look for, it's, it's a busy slide, but it's, it's pretty much what, what we've been talking all day. But I want them to be pain-free during the, the break test that I showed you. Uh, I want them to be stronger in the, if there's the dominant arm, which is often is in, in our handball players. Uh, the traumatic injuries we often see in the, in the non-dominant shoulder. I want it to be at least 120% of the non-dominant shoulder. And if you're looking at ratio, I sh don't think we should stare blind at the ratio. Uh, in our youth players, we have some of us really good ratio because they're too weak in the internal rotation. But perhaps in the senior player, at least 0 0.8, so 80% external rotation, internal rotation. Pain-free during their full range of motion, I should be able to bend their arm without any pain. Fulfill the training program. Looking at aerobic capacity, we do a five-minute uh, maximum speed test. Run as, as fast as you can for five minutes. See if that's restored. Often they, they can keep the aerobic capacity when they have a shoulder problem. It's more, more of a problem when you have a lower limb problem. Pain-free test. And I want them to be super confident of playing game. I want them to be super confident going out there and doing what they should do. And return to sports not just decided on one test for me. It's a test battery. This is the one that I, I currently use, but it's been shifting throughout the years. And, and I think you should test it several times, not just one time. So I just want to highlight some things here. I think we also should consider player-specific criteria. I think it's, it's, you should have a higher criteria for a backcourt player throwing a lot compared to a goalie or, or a wingman uh, in handball. We, if you have pre-injured data, that would be great. So trying to test them, not screen them to try out, see if you're the one that's going to get injured, you're the one that's going to get injured, just only so you can get some pre-injured data. So you can use that as a, as a benchmark when you're coming back. And return to sports, a mutual decision. 
we can go with our input, but it's a mutual decision, especially in the young ones, which should involve the parents as well. And try to work, uh, avoid spiking the workload. Marette addressed this, this earlier, but especially when they're coming back from, from post-injury. Thank you so much. <laughs>